Welcome to Father and Son. Welcome, Tom. Morning, Dave. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. We're going to talk about Fosters today, the demise of Fosters. There's a beautiful picture behind me there, which basically shows uh, a 1985 Melbourne Cup where we started to fosterise the world. We had about 50% market share in those days, and uh, we realised that if we're going to grow our brewing business, we have to go international. And you were busy explaining those tactics to uh, none less than Princess Diana. I was. She invited me around for morning tea, but I didn't ever go. <laughs> well, she might have been still alive, had I? Well. And when I left Foster's in the year 2000, um, we had 54% market share, and we were the fourth beat in Australia, and we were the fourth biggest brewer in the world. We built up a fantastic brewing business, I mean, the Courage Brewery. We then bought. Uh, a big Canadian brewery, merged it in with Molson, so we were the biggest brewer in Canada, uh, second biggest in the UK. Foster's today is still the largest selling lager in England, and clearly we dominated the Australian market. Now look at the mess now. Well, that's right. I mean, the Australian market share has fallen quite dramatically. I think the, uh, all the problems the companies have with the wine acquisitions has led them to take their eye off the ball when it comes to the mainstay business, which is beer, to a lesser extent spirits, and of course, overseas, you know, Foster's is largely made under license these days. You know, the company doesn't own brewing assets anymore. You know, maybe the that's the era was starting to sell off all the brewing assets. Yes. Then they sold off the royalties to get a capital sum. Mm. The only brewing business they've got left is CUB, yeah, which you know, is still a wonderful cash mm -hmm. cow. But now they're losing market share. They're down at forty-eight percent. Well, they've made some colossal mistakes. I mean, one was, uh, you know, VB used to be 30% of the Australian market. I think it's only half that now. About uh, 23. Oh, well, 23, I thought it might have fallen even more. But one of the things they made, or the mistakes they made with VB, was to cut the alcohol content exactly. in an effort to reduce excise. And what you see here is a continued pattern of short-term decisions, selling off breweries to get a capital sum, or overseas breweries, selling off royalty streams, reducing the alcohol, and you upset your core drinkers. And you know, these days with so many more brands on offer, they are turning to them and they're trying different beers and uh, that hasn't been very good for CUB. I think the other problem is that the investment in wine that they made was mm. a fundamental error. Uh, when they bought Behringer, they bought it when the Aussie dollar was 52. And about three months after they bought it, which was one of the biggest wine groups in the United States, there was a huge battle and prices dropped about 10% because it was oversupply of wine. Well, that's right. I mean, the American wine drinker is used to only paying a few dollars a bottle, and uh, unfortunately, that hasn't changed very much. Brands like Two Buck Chuck, as it's called, and so forth. Yellowtail, which is a successful Australian brand in the US, but Americans, by and large, don't drink that much wine, which means that it could still grow. But what they do drink, they pay very low price points for. And I think the other issue is that the problems that the wine industry has had has probably taken um, Foster's management eye off the ball. Uh, they've taken their beer business for granted. That's now struggling. And uh, you know they've agreed to demerge the businesses, to, to undo the South Corp and Behringer takeovers and separate beer, beer and spirits from wine. Uh, personally, I think the outcome of that will ultimately be a takeover. I think you're right. Now, it's interesting. They've invested over this period in wine about $7 billion. And I see the pundits are saying that the wine business is probably worth about two today on a seven times earnings. Two on a good day, yeah. And that means they've ruined or written off five billion of shareholder value. And the interesting thing, that the reason we didn't go into wine is the barrier to entry in beer is fantastic. Mm. It costs you several billion to build a big brewery. And once you get your market share, even though the market's not growing much and was falling, it's been slightly falling in Australia, you've got very difficult for people to come in. That's right. Whereas wineries, I mean, anybody who makes a little bit of money goes and buys a you know, a winery on the Mornington Peninsula or the Hunter Valley or something, you know, somewhere and, and just and, and it starts producing wine, you've got this proliferation of brands. It's expensive to distribute. Uh, you often have to try and charge high price points at the time when you need competition is intense. And, and you know, it's it's just a difficult business. And I, I cannot still for the life of me see why. And this is the other thing: a beer business is an industrial process. And you make beer in a big vat and you pump it out, and it's the same every time. Wine is like a cottage industry. It relies on the vagaries of the weather and good years and bad years. Very difficult business. So who's going to buy it? What do you think? I mean, they, they really ought to be slaughtered, the directors, and fancy adding the police commissioner onto the board. 
Right. <laughs> and you'd probably be careful about saying suggesting people should be slaughtered, but I agree. Sticking Christine well, Nixon on board is uh, is just a, such a silly decision. Well, who could potentially buy it? Uh, Molson's, intriguingly, is, uh, used to be part of the CUB Empire in Canada, still has a 5%, or has a 5% stake. Yep. Um, I think SAB Miller, the old South African breweries, and of course Miller, the American brewer, yep. you know, they're one of the world's biggest. Um, I wouldn't go past the Japanese. Now, only less than a year ago, we saw Kieran uh, mop up uh, all of Lion Nathan. That's right. Uh, and Asahi has had a very good relationship with Foster's, which I cultivated. And, and, and you think, you know, we have problems. I mean, the Japanese market's in dire straits because their, their population isn't growing, their economies have been stuffed. So as a result, they look at Australia and say, well, that's still a good market. I wouldn't put it past Asahi to be the bidder for Foster's either before or, or after the demerger from the wine business. Well, I think the demerger of the wine business will make it the brewing business much more attractive to the people you it just will. mentioned. It will. So I don't think anybody will come until they demerge it. Well, they might or they might not. There's a, there is an alternative school of thought that says you actually get it more cheaply, but you can still demerge it. You buy the whole thing now, spin off the wine business just as the current board would do, and then you just keep the beer business. But I agree. I think once it's demerged, the wine business will find its value, and it's worth something. I mean, whether it's one and a half, two, or two and a half billion, but the beer business will attract a takeover premium. I do think that's the most likely outcome. They'll demerge and then a, a takeover offer will come. And of course, it'll be a sad moment in many ways. I mean, Australia's two main breweries, 90% of its beer market will be in foreign hands, possibly or, or entirely in Japanese hands, there, which for yeah. older people might seem a bit, uh, well, a bit strange. Well, I think it's very disappointing to see one of the great icons of Australia. We've seen mm -hmm. Arnott's go foreign, we've seen Vegemite many years ago go foreign. You can't stop these things happening, I don't think you should. But Foster's is probably the greatest national icon in Australia. That's true, and I think the sad thing is, is that Foster's has more, in my view, iconic brands than Lion Nathan ever had. Lion Nathan has done very well stealing market share. But Foster's has been brought undone by a series, over a decade, a series of bad decisions. Yeah. And unfortunately, if a takeover is what results, well, that is how you know assets go well, yeah. from the dumb to the smart. But in this case, it probably will be to an overseas group. I think I can't see anybody in Australia buying it. No, yeah. well, it's, it's not going to happen. So. All right, well, it's a rather sad occasion for me, but uh, I, I, I can't see any option that, that they will be taken over. It's just a question of, is it the Japanese, is it SAB Miller, is it Heineken? We don't know, uh, but it almost certainly will be one of them. Look, it's still a great prize, and it's a test testament to how good it is that people will want to buy it. But at the same time, it will be said. I know what I'd be doing right now if I were Foster's. I'd be putting VB back up to 4.9%. Oh, look, I mean, it was such a silly decision. I mean, the reality is there's not that much difference between lagers and it's, it's called a bitter in Australia, but it's a lager. But the point is people look at it and say, I'm not getting my money's worth. Do you remember when Cascade a few years ago reduced their stubby from 375 to 345 yeah. mils? What they gained in terms of reducing the size of the bottle by less than 10% was nothing compared to how much they upset their, their yeah, loyal Tasmanian drinkers the who just turned away. I mean, so you, you make these changes at your peril in the world of beer. No doubt.